Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we'll be doing a long-awaited analysis of the entire clone army. Now before we do begin, there is two sides to every story. There's everything wrong and everything right. Check out our pals over at Geetsleys for the everything right version of this video after you watch this. Geetsleys channel is also all about stars, but they focus more on the Clone Wars specifically. Better yet, he's from Australia, the fictional country created by NASA to convince us that the world is a sphere. So check them out. The Grand Army of the Republic fielded some of the most expensive and talented soldiers the galaxy had ever seen. This was because they were custom cloned from a modified strain of Jango Fett's DNA. Count Dooku had specifically hand-selected the bounty hunter for the job after he had faced Jango and his true Mandalorians during the Battle of Galadron. Dooku had still been a Jedi Master at the time and he witnessed Jango Fett kill six Jedi with his bare hands. Current medical research is teaching us here on Earth that a human's genes play a much bigger role in our development and personality than we had originally thought. Nurture still matters, but we kind of have certain level caps in place for certain attributes. Now, the Kaminoans took Jango Fed's DNA and modified some of the less desirable traits and tried to make the clones more obedient, for instance. The R&D phase of modifying the DNA took a considerable amount of time and money. That's why in Legends you also had many failed batches of clones like the Null Arcs or 99. Like any pharma company, a lot of money needs to be pumped into the program before they even start making the final product. And when they did start making the clones, it took over nine years for them to fully mature. During this time, the Kaminoan cloners had to house feed, clothe, and teach them everything from how to use a refresher to field stripping a DC-15. This cost and training time would later be passed on to the Republic. Now, the Republic is a rich place, the richest in the galaxy. The government collects taxes from thousands of major planetary systems and even more tribute from colonies and protectorates. But for more than a thousand years, the Republic's budget didn't include funding a military, and overnight, with the start of hostilities during the Battle of Geonosis, the Republic all of a sudden had to absorb the costs of the clone army. The US government spends around 15% of our budget on the military and almost 57% of our discretionary spending. So by absorbing this new clone army, the Republic was immediately faced with a budget crisis. At the same time, many member states were leaving along with their tax revenue. Ultimately, the Republic decided to adopt the clone army, as the Separatist threat was considered an existential one. But the clone army was far too expensive and took far too long to develop, especially when you compare it alongside something as cheap as a B-1 battle droid. This was a modified version of a security droid that had already been in development for almost a decade. Any R&D costs would have already been offset by sales. On top of that, the B-1 battle droids were created by Bactoid Combat Automata and Armor Workshop, which was owned by the Techno Union and run by Separatist leader Wat Tambor. Instead of contracting a third-party manufacturer like the Republic did with the Kaminoans, the Separatists already had a state-owned military industrial complex. The B-1 battle droids themselves were extremely cheap to make, they were made of low-grade materials, and could be manufactured in just a minute. A clone trooper had to kill dozens, even hundreds, of B-1 battle droids in order to justify the cost and time it took to create one. What made things even worse was the kind of war the GAR was fighting. They were immediately on the defensive. Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious had been planning this war for a considerable amount of time, and Separatist forces immediately started attacking Republic worlds after the Battle of Geonosis. They were also able to effectively cut the GAR from the center of the galaxy and Coruscant and wreak havoc across the galaxy. The main goal of the Separatist Alliance was to destabilize the Republic. They didn't necessarily even have to take over a lot of Republic territory, but just expose the Republic's inability to defend its member states. The Republic at the time was bogged down by bureaucracy and corruption, which further bolstered the secessionists. And if the Grand Army of the Republic couldn't keep these member states safe, why would they pay any taxes in the first place? The clone troopers had excellent training and morale and could be depended on in almost any kind of combat situation. But there were just far too few of them, which meant when Anakin's 501st was deployed on one world, it left five other Republic worlds open to CIS attack. What the GAR needed was a massive defense force that could protect all of the Republic worlds, either through drafting or asking local volunteers to create militias or using cheap battle droids. These forces don't need to be especially well-equipped or trained, but just good enough to fight alongside defensive positions long enough for the regular military to arrive. In Legends, the Empire had a similar arrangement. 
Army troopers and Navy troopers were used as garrison forts as well as the stormtroopers were used as shock troopers. Now as far as weapons, vehicles, and equipment go, the clones had some really great tech. And then they also had some really bad stuff. Let's focus on the bad stuff. First, the Phase 1 armor. While extremely durable, it was created by Kaminoans who understood little about human anatomy and pressure points in comfort. And as protective as this armor was, if it was pinching your balls, armpits, or head all day, it's probably not going to stay on. It also caused increased fatigue, which really isn't great. It should be mentioned that Phase 2 armor was a lot more comfortable. Then there was the standard Clone Trooper DC-15 blaster rifle. The thing was the size of a crew service machine gun. Well, actually, that's what the special effects people designed it off of. While it was effective on the open plains of Geonosis, it was more or less useless in the underground caves of the Geonosian hives or within the tight corridors of a separatist ship. It really didn't have practical ergonomics. The DC-15S carbine variant would have eventually replace the DC-15 and cut down the size of the weapon dramatically. The GAR ground vehicles were more or less pretty solid, so we won't be talking about any of them. But one particular starfighter that caused a lot of problems was the ARC-170. It wasn't that the ARC-170 was a terrible starfighter, but just like the clone troopers were overkill compared to the very cheap E-1 battle droids, the ARC-170 was also very expensive and overkill compared to the vulture droids and tri-fighter droids that the Separatists used. The ARC-170 was over-engineered and equipped with almost every amenity a pilot could want. The ARC-170 also had a crew of three, but at the end of the day, an ARC-170 could easily be taken down by a vulture droid or a tri-droid, which was just a fraction of the cost. Now, the leadership of the clone army was quite disastrous. While many peacekeeping officers from the Judicials entered service in the GAR, the majority of the high-ranking officer positions were taken by Jedi. For some reason, the Republic assumed because of their connection to the Force that the Jedi would make superior soldiers and commanders. While they were excellent one-on-one -on -one combatants, most of the Jedi lacked actual military leadership experience. It should also be mentioned that a Jedi's strategy and tactics and even view on life was very different from that of an ordinary average person. The Jedi were basically living gods on the battlefield. They were able to sense incoming threats and avoid or intercept them. They didn't really need to take cover. No wall or door could really stop them. And sometimes they forgot that the clones following them just weren't able to keep up and do the same things. But of course, the clones, being obedient soldiers, would always try anyway, and most of the time suffer massive casualties as a result. A Jedi sees a fortified position across an open plain and decides to run across it because they most likely will be able to survive. A trained soldier and tactician would either screen their movements with smoke, use mobilized infantry to increase their speed, or just not attack. Through their lack of experience and strategy, the Jedi caused countless clones to die needlessly. This undoubtedly caused tension between the Jedi and their troops. A better option would have been to allow the clones to advance through the ranks and eventually reach higher level positions. Not only did clones have a much closer connection to other clones, they also were trained all their life to fight and were capable of making much more rational decisions based on understanding their brother's skills and limitations. While the clones were very eager to fight for the Republic and very obedient and loyal, that started changing after the Battle of Geonosis. No matter how much genetic conditioning you give the clones, they were still humans. And as humans, they began understanding just how terrible their situation in life was and how terrible their commanders and Jedi commanders were treating them. One of the biggest problems with the JAR was there was no clear way to prepare the clones for a life after service. For one, the Republic was cash-strapped and could barely afford funding the JAR, let alone providing them with the retirement package. And unlike civilian soldiers, these clone troopers had no skills outside of warfare and no other family that could share the burden of taking care of them. The Senate was clueless on how to deal with these millions, if not billions, of men that would eventually have to retire. And as usual, whenever senators encounter real problems with difficult solutions, they usually end up avoiding the subject and focusing on something else. The fact that clones weren't citizens and couldn't vote made that much easier to do. And so we began seeing, even in the early days of the war, clones crack under pressure, betray their units, and even go AWOL. The massive casualties, lack of leadership from the Jedi began clashing with the clones' indoctrination and eventually human nature won out and the clones began questioning their existence and why they were fighting for the GAR. On top of that, they were also aging twice the normal speed of normal humans. Considering all of this, had the Clone Wars continued, it was very likely that the JR would have imploded unless they significantly changed how they treated these soldiers. 
So there you have it guys, that's our view of everything wrong with the clone army. Obviously there are a lot of other things we could talk about, so let me know in the comment section below what you think. And also don't forget to check out Geetsley's Everything's Right version of this video. We'll link it down in the description below. Anyway guys, thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.